know is a constant, but in another constant of the motion, uh, that's cool. What you do is, is, this is called reduction to quadrature in the literature. It's called a quadrature or quarter cycle is, is really to say, quarter cycle solution uh, for some oscillatory uh, uh, mechanism. You're basically going from a low value of the radius to a maximum value. That is, you're going from um, the perigee, the low point in an orbit, to the up, ap apogee, the maximum amplitude. And that's usually a quarter of a cycle in some sense, a quarter of, of uh, the motion and quadrature. That's the best uh, um, etymology I can give you for the name reduction to quadrature. Okay, so that's an integral we'll play with uh, later on. That's the one that's going to give us a geometry of Coulomb orbits as clearly as the geometry of the oscillator. But we're going to uh, spend some time looking at both of them uh, here. Uh, now. Okay, so that that uh, is the end, of, for now anyway, of the algebra discussion relating this Paris versus Dublin, okay, French Lagrangian approach versus the uh, Hamilton uh, Irish uh, takeoff mechanics. Okay, is there any anything you uh, want? Is it all making sense? Um, and uh, we could have a, a midterm right now and you'd be able to write all this down, right? Uh, yeah, well that's, you know, that's where you should get to. I mean, this is kind of stuff that you should be able to put together. As I said, you should go and be able to go home and derive uh, the um, Lagrangian equations just from scratch. Think what it is, the logic that went into it, and uh, just come up with that. Because when you do that, that, that will really cement a lot of this stuff. Otherwise, it's in one ear and out the other. Uh, when you don't use it in some way. You don't get stronger by watching somebody else do push-ups. That's what they used to say for uh, gyms. But here it's true too. It's involving the muscles up here. Right? Okay. Well, let's take a look um, at uh, the effective potentials for the oscillator. Okay, this harmonic oscillator. See, what could be so hard about a parabola r squared well, what could be so hard is that the angular momentum, if it's not zero, involves an inverse R squared. The centrifugal barrier, the barrier that keeps you from, when you have any angular momentum at all, it keeps you away from the from this R equals zero. So there, there's a typical effective potential for uh, an angular momentum. I'm using mu now for the L. Here's mu equals zero. You can go, if you've got mu equals zero, you know an oscillator likes to go through the center, right? Can't do it here. And of course that has great quantum mechanical significance. It means the wave function has to be absolutely zero for anything that has an L not zero. Can't be any part of there at all. And that the wave function that's everywhere else, right? That's the key thing. The centrifugal barrier completely uh, avoid, makes it avoid the uh, r equals zero point. Well, there's an evanescent wave, right? But that's zero. That's zero too. Okay? So, that's what we want to play with. And here is a, a picture of an orbit. And it's hard to tell, you know, what all is happening here until we animate this one. So we're going to be splitting the screens up now and do some animation. I think we'll do it on the middle one. Uh, we were having issues with uh, complete drawing of these uh, orbits, but let's go ahead and get uh, this one in, uh, uh, going uh, there. Um, we get to see uh, some of these uh, effects, the effective potential and its um, centrifugal part uh, playing a role. Okay, so I'll bring this one up to that point 
and I will um, start, I'll see if I can get the um, simulation going here. This is the oscillator PE, yeah. You can see that this is really quite an oversimplified uh, picture of, first of all, the X and Y coordinates that are making the ellipse that we, this is what we constructed by ruler and compass, right? And of course the idea is that this uh, ellipse could be at any orientation, so orientation is completely ignored by the uh, effective uh, potential diagram, this one. It's not taking into account the fact that there's a world outside of a plane. And it's, the idea is that the plane that you have here is literally rotating around, uh, depending on where phi is. Okay, so th that's uh, uh, one thing uh, to notice. So this thing goes from perigee to apogee back to perigee, back to apogee. It does two trips, perigee to apogee, in one orbit. Exactly. So that's a very specific symmetry that the oscillator has. When we look at it in polar coordinates, we comment on apogees, perigees. There's the apogee up there, and there's perigee. So, uh, reaching into this um, region right here, uh, one of the things I can do uh, is just bring this thing uh, pretty much to a stop. Well, I didn't quite get it. It's still oscillating just a little bit. I didn't quite get the bottom of that green curve, which is the total effective potential. But it's close enough that you can't tell this from a circle, right? It's not moving its radius very much at all. It's an ellipse. Well, a circle is an ellipse too, but this one is an imperfect circle in a sense. It's slightly elongated. So it has a, um, I think that's the uh, apogee and then the perigee is coming up. But you can't see it very easily. In any case, uh, if I just go up here and just pick a random thing, a position on the thing, let her go, well, this diagram is going to look the same for any ellipse of that orientation. And you'll notice when we plot PX versus PY, we're getting pretty much the same curve as this one. Remember how we studied the calculus of the two-dimensional oscillator and noticed that uh, the ellipse uh, for velocity was the same ellipse as the uh, position when omega was equal to 1. Now omega is not equal to 1, so one of them is bigger than the other, but still the same orientation, right? That's kind of neat to, to see. Mr. Harder, they appear to be a quarter out of phase as well. And that is what, what you know is it just went, this one went by its uh, perigee when this one was at its happening. There, there it's happening again. Zooming by there while well, that one was reaching its peak. That was the other thing we noticed. There were pi r2 out of phase, right? Thank you. Okay. So, you know, no matter what you make, you can go clear up here and have it go way out there. And then it comes back again and goes bam off a really hard wall here. And that bang is right now, just as it passes its uh, perigee. And then it takes its good old time while it's up at the apogee. It doesn't uh, turn around very fast, right? Meanwhile, we can do plots of other quantities here versus time, and they're basically not interesting oscillatory. Well, they're just sine, basically sine, sine or near sine. Things. Okay. All right. Well, that's the uh, um, inside the Earth 
motion, the, the neutron, the, the neutri, neutron starlet uh, particle going around inside a isotropic uh, oscillator. Let's see if we can get something else uh, going here. This is um, effective potential and orbits uh, for the oscillator. Uh, I want to see if I've got here cool. Yes, I do. Okay. So this is what we're going for uh, right here. Now I have to back out of this one. Let me I'll make sure that I'm not using CPU. Uh, unnecessarily because run the code as fast but it's eventually got to give it some more give it some computer time. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and back out of this, go forward to the Coulomb one and uh, see what that looks like. I think we can get that started here. We were having some trouble yeah here we go. Now there's some surprises here in this plot that we will explain later on in unit uh, three, uh, actually a little bit in two, um, but really unit five is where we mention that bizarre behavior right there. Plotting PX versus PY gives a circle. It's always a circle. This can be a circle can have a nice circular orbit in a Coulomb field by being at the bottom of a, of a, a particular effective potential. And I'm trying to see if I can uh, get this thing to that point. I'm not quite there. Again, this is a little bit elliptical. But that one's still a perfect circle. Anybody ever been taught that that's what uh, momentum does in a Coulomb field. Have you ever seen that anywhere? You should have. <laughs> he says with 2020 hindsight. <laughs> that's really cool. I didn't notice that until we got a simulation. As you make uh, more um, eccentric um, orbits. I forget where this one has the, the position velocity clicking. Uh, it should be. Just let's click see and drag. Can, let's see if we can get a... I'm having a little trouble with my uh, boost here. Let's see if I can get a nice eccentric. You see, one of the things this thing does is show you where your effective potential is a little bit. I don't want to throw the thing out of the... out of the um, thing. I'll bring it down here. Uh, let's just try an ellipse like this for the heck of it, see what happens. Here we go. Watch that circle. It's taken a long time, a long time to get around the apogee. And now it's starting to fall. It's starting to fall. It's going boom around the circle, right? Isn't that cool? So this is the outside the earth uh, guy, but it's got that geometry. And these guys are kind of bouncing along here. That lost a little bit of energy. Pardon? Our orbit was just a little too close. The algorithm lost some energy on each of those Yeah, passes. you can see that happening. You can watch the energy here when it does the next one. See, it's very happy out there on the extremes of the Coulomb, where it's very flat, very flat uh, potential, very, very flat force curve. I didn't bother to draw that. But when you come in there, bang, see, I lost a couple points on the energy here. That means the rung of it needs to be step size uh, dependent, which makes it not quite real time. That's what the price you pay if you're doing simulations for visualization. Okay, so. Uh, that, that, I think that is uh, a neat uh, message there. Starting to think in this region, same deal. Yeah, a little bit of loss. 
and I see I'm losing it in the third figure uh, every time on that one as well. But that basic idea of what's uh, happening is uh, present in both of these. Okay? All right. So, centrifugal barrier for Coulomb, pretty important as well. And a uh, barrier here, but it has a well. And finally, as you get up to escape velocity, then, then the curve uh, becomes repellent and uh, no closed orbit. You get a hyper hyperbolic orbit. We'll worry about that stuff uh, later on. But this is enough, I think, uh, to see uh, what we're uh, up against here. Okay, um, let me back out of this. There are a couple more things that I'd like to uh, show before we're done with class today. Um, I want to remind you um, of the three steps to heaven, or going the other way, the three steps to hell. Remember that as we uh, talked about the geometry of the plot that makes a change from the Coulomb potential uh, to the oscillator potential right at the surface of a uniform sophomore physics Earth, a uniform uh, sphere. This would be true for a uniform charge density as well as a uniform mass density uh, in the green region. Okay, So you, I want you to, once again, and we'll play with this more later on, this is part of the symmetry of the Coulomb business. Back in lecture six, we had this uh, picture here. And um, go ahead, put the uh, thing on the other screens here as well. So it's the three steps. Uh, from sitting inside uh, at the bottom of the harmonic oscillator potential and asking uh, how much energy you take to get to be sitting on the surface of the uh, object, whatever it is, how much does it take to get orbiting in a circular orbit at that altitude, uh, that's this dot right here, and uh, that's an equal jump from here, and then finally to just get out of here, be gone, and be uh, sitting at zero velocity at infinity, whatever that means, that means you're out of here. Uh, that's another jump of the same amount. Okay, remember this? Okay. And probably worth noting uh, what the extreme cases of that were. Uh, first of all, uh, there are all the formulas that we worked out uh, in that uh, uh, three-step problem. This is again lecture six. We're going to be doing that all over again later on, uh, maybe a little more elegantly, and we also talked about crushing um, our sophomore physics earth uh, and uh, the uh, lessons there. Uh, I hope they made some impression at the time. So that uh, is, is what we have uh, to work with. Now, uh, the question is whether we can use the next few minutes here uh, to take care of some things that uh, I would like not to have to spend a whole too much time uh, with um, on the next lecture where we try to make connections for our Hamilton, Lagrangian, and quantum mechanics. So uh, what I'd like to go ahead is, I say normally we'd stop right here, but I would like to um, just tell you a little bit about um, the pendulum. Now there's another kind of pendulum that I call a cycloidulum or something like that, and that's what we'll spend some time on, on in a lecture uh, coming Thursday. And we'll also talk about a little bit about what I call the Jerkut system. That's parametric amplification uh, is a big deal for that. And I have something called catcher in the eye. I might be able to show a little bit of that right now. But mainly I want to look at the pendulum. The Hamiltonian for the pendulum is really quite uh, beautiful. And um, these are the three geometries that you would use to consider. First, the force. Every sophomore physics uh, textbook uh, has uh, the very first one there. Uh, just asking what does gravity 
uh, do, well, it pulls that much uh, force in this direction. No matter where you are, it's always hanging straight down. But its component, in terms of how uh, its effective uh, effect is, is felt, the, uh, uh, th this particular uh, force right here uh, will have its maximum right here will be absolutely zero right here, and that's just a, a sign, a projection uh, for uh, mgx, x being r sine theta. For small angles, just r times uh, the angle theta uh, for small oscillations. Okay. But this is not a harmonic oscillator for anything but the small angles. So uh, we're also interested in the energy geometry. This is where we figure out uh, what um, the height is. That's a, a Thales rectangle problem when we talked about the super ball being compressed. But that's what we're interested in. What's the energy effect? And then finally, the time geometry and the elliptic functions and all that come out of this. And that's something we'll study later. But there are the three geometries that make us have this particular Lagrangian. Now this particular Lagrangian has a Hamiltonian to go with it, but I want you to notice a uh, very common lo loci, lo locuses, for plus and minus sine blunders. The potential here is a minus cosine of uh, the uh, idea being that as I, uh, as I uh, go up, I should have, for my um, small angle thing, I should have a parabola that's like this, but a cosine is like this. So i got to turn the cosine or the minus sign down like this so I can have something that uh, sits at the bottom. That's what my potential is. And therefore, the Lagrangian, which has a minus potential, has a plus sign here. But the Hamiltonian has got a minus sign there. Okay, So, uh, in dealing with that, a uh, couple of sign flips here that could easily uh, throw you. Now, I don't need to make a big fuss about this anymore. We don't have a qualifying exam anymore that makes people make mistakes like that. But still, you could make a mistake like that before an important talk somewhere where you would have gotten a really good job if you hadn't have screwed that one sign. So the warning is, I hope, taken. Okay, there's lots of ways when time signs are being flipped a lot that you want to understand the problem well enough to say, yeah, that's the right sign. I'm not worried. In any case, this is the, the, uh, uh, what we have to uh, solve. And this is what the Hamiltonian looks like. This is a case where you simply plot the Hamiltonian h of p phi, or theta, I'm using theta now, okay, that's in this direction, and then uh, the cosine of theta with a minus sign is in this direction. There's a bottom of the minus cosine right there, going to the top right there, and then back down again, and forever and ever, all the way down to Fort Smith, and up to Bentonville, uh, we've got this cosine curve, right? And every time you go over the uh, the pass, you see, uh, there's a set of lines there that mark the uh, outside of a phase diagram which shows all the possible trajectories here with a velocity that's getting faster and faster and faster as we go up this side of the, of the mountain that never comes down. And up on this side, another mountain that never comes down. Okay. And then there's another ridge right here that never comes down uh, uh, if that's its bottom. That's a saddle point. Okay, so there's this topology of a, of a anharmonic oscillator. That's what we're dealing with uh, with this uh, Hamiltonian. Now there's a couple of ways to look at a Hamiltonian and let's go ahead and get this picture. It doesn't show very well there because of the, uh, of the defect uh, in this particular computer, which I have not yet had uh, fixed, but uh, you can look at it uh, either side of the room now. 
and I might as well go ahead and put the rest of the equations of motion, they're really quite uh, striking, uh, these Hamilton equations of motion. Uh, I can see the thing there. Basically, it's Q dot equal partial pH, that's first equation, P dot equal minus partial with respect to Q of H. Well, that's a cross product of a gradient of H. So what this is telling is you, when you have a high gradient, uh, you've got a lot of something uh, that's making you move. If it was just the gradient in this uh, direction right here, you know that's the force toward the center. But when it's the gradient on this line right here, it's telling you how fast you're going to go by when you go around this corner here. You're going to go really fast because it's really steep there. You're going to slow down here where the thing is not as steep and so forth. So what this is telling you is it's E H, that's the unit vector of, along the Hamiltonian axis, cross the gradient with a minus sign. And so uh, what you do is you take your left hand, I think that's, no, you take your right hand in this case, I'm thinking of my rotors, uh, you, you take your right hand and put it on, on the Hamiltonian axis I'm sorry, it's your left hand. It's got to be. This is a phase space. Uh, you put your thumb up the axis there, and that's the direction that you go in the phase space. The kind of uh, easy argument for that is, is when you're, uh, I've got a, uh, I'm up here on this side um, where the momentum, that, that's the phase, uh, angular momentum is high, I've got to go positive. So uh, this has to be left, just like our phasers uh, oscillate. Okay, this, and, 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 and the phaser that's a circle is, you know, very, very close to a circle, is down at the bottom. But here they get to be very weird. So that's uh, what uh, I would like to show you a simulation of very quickly uh, uh, for that uh, motion. See if I can uh, find it here. Um, I may have to go back and kick it off of the uh, menu here. Uh, yes, I have to go get it uh, right here. And you guys can look at the uh, others and you'll be ahead for the lectures. But here's a picture of something going around that. Now I'll start off at the bottom of the well, okay, uh, right here. And that'll make a cosine curve of a frequency that's a lot faster than the one we just saw. And then I go a little bit higher here, you see, uh, to one, and start it again. And you can see that that is a slower frequency. The cosine's fatter than the uh, original one. And if I go inside that circle, you won't be seeing much of a difference. You can see that you don't see the diversion to get, you know, out to the end there. And the closer I get to the uh, center there, uh, the closer I get to being a harmonic oscillator. I was a little sloppy in the placement there. But when you go out very far, then you start making things that really aren't cosines anymore. They're elliptic functions. And the si science and mathematics of elliptic functions is really quite beautiful. And this is something that Brad Clay uh, has taken as his project to study the mathematics. Whoops, I went too far. Uh, I've, I've got to actually look at this thing right here, see if I can get uh, one that doesn't... There we go. Now in quantum mechanics of Bose-Einstein condensate, these functions are actual wave functions. And they're functions that go a long way before they go down, then they sit a long way, and then they come up. Really incredible functions. And they're wave function for BEC. This is something uh, Bill Reinhardt and uh, Phillips discovered not too long ago. Anyway, that's the uh, phase space. Now the rest of the phase space, of course, when you go here, or here, you approach this rotation, uniform rotation, but here it's kind of non-uniform rotation. It slows down at the top noticeably. 
But the rest of it is an inside job, and there's period, periodic. But not harmonically. This is not harmonic. The question is, how do you make this harmonic? How do you save physics? And the answer is on the wall back there in the corner, and that's what we're going to look at uh, next time, among other things. That's a Huygens pendulum. Huygens, the guy that made the Huygens contact wave thing, brilliant person, brilliant person. But it, did, it took until he was just about to die and he figured out how to make pendulums really precise using cycloids. Save physics. Physics, it didn't look like physics was working. The clocks really couldn't keep time. Change the amplitude, they, they slowed down. Okay, we'll uh, see you on Thursday with that and some other things that relate to quantum.